Hey there, comic book fans. Got something a little odd for you tonight. Here's a comic probably none of you have ever heard of. It's um, from 1986 and 1987, part of the black and white boom. And I'm kind of doing this because uh, recently, I don't, uh, comic crack, I don't know if you've ever seen a Comic Cracks channel, but he collects a lot of this sort of stuff, sort of indie stuff from the 80s, this real obscure stuff. And I was buying it at the time. So he actually has been picking up issues of Night Streets recently, and he's pretty much the only person besides me who I've ever seen have Night Streets. And I got mine back in the 80s as they were coming out, and he's getting his now, so it's kind of amusing. But there were five issues. Came out about, um, I think it said it was quarterly. But um, it came out like maybe twice a year in 86 and 87. And there's supposed to be a sixth issue that never came out because the series got canceled, or I, I think the whole play, what is it, uh, Arrow Comics may have gone out of business then. And in like 1990, Caliper Comics collected all these into two trade paperbacks, including the missing sixth issue, which I never got. Um, but I, I'm kind of happy with it being incomplete, with it being sort of an unfinished thing. Uh, and I have to say that in rereading this for the first time since the 80s, I, I'm pretty sure, you know, I, I, well, I know I read these as they came out, and I'm pretty sure I read it at least once altogether as one thing in the 80s, but I haven't picked it out since, but I had good memories of it. And uh, the other thing that's interesting is I'm not a big nostalgia person, uh, meaning that I, I kind of don't, uh, I, I don't get nostalgic over a lot of stuff. But this, reading this, really made me nostalgic for sort of the black and white boom of the 1980s, which was a completely unique time in comics. Uh, and first, we'll give you the credits. The, the main guy doing this is named Mark Bloodworth. Where is his, uh, there we go. Script and illustrations, Mark Bloodworth. The first three covers are done by, um, let's see, the, his name is on them somewhere. Armstrong painted the first three covers, and then Mark Bloodworth did the last two covers. And the, the painted covers are pretty cool. They're not, that looks like, uh, airbrush. It's mostly air, but the first one looked like it had a little color pencil in it. And then the next ones are kind of traditional, more traditional media. Looks like, I don't even know what this is done in. Looks like some marker. Could be ink, marker, colored pencil, all sorts of stuff. But in rereading this, like it really brought me back to the, to the 1980s. And I even read the editorials and the letters pages. Like, it starts out with a... I mean, these, these guys are kind of really gung-ho to put together. What made, the, what made the black and white boom of the 80s different than any other time is because of the Turtles, all of a sudden, anybody could hit it big. Anybody could have a hit comic. I mean, I was, I was an indie guy even all the way back here, back then. But most people were. I, I was. I was already in 1986 buying plenty of black and white comics for a few years at least. But most people weren't. Most comic fans would never buy a black and white comic because they just saw them as inferior and incomplete without color. But the Turtles changed that all around. All of a sudden, the Turtles got stores to buy. To, got stores to order black and white comics, and more importantly got fans to buy black and white comics, hoping that they were going to see the next Turtles happen uh, for its entertainment value and for its monetary value. So all of a sudden, like a book like Night Streets would have a hard time existing without the Turtles changing everything. But um, I really enjoyed this. We have, we have here, he's, matter of fact, he's saying, it's not a boom. This is all about good comics. And you know, interesting, who is this, uh, I forget who the editor was. Um, is this issue one? Yeah, the editor's name must be here somewhere, but I don't see it. 
Uh, Ralph and Stu. Oh, I think Ralph was the one guy. Where is this? Du -du 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 -du. See if his name is here, just because I want to get his name. Ah, can't find it. I'll find it later. But anyway, oh, maybe it's in the back credits. Let's see. Let's see if we can get that editor's name who did such a good job with the editorials. Stu Kerr. What is our editor? Editor. And this comic is um, a crime comic. It's it's uh, about what the weird thing is. It's a completely straightforward crime comic about these two crime families, and it's got a huge cast, and it's got cops in it. It's got the the cr two crime families. It's got a uh, cartoonist who draw who draws this, this, that right there is um what's her name again the Black Dahlia. She's sort of a superhero but really more in the lines of a Batman type superhero. And she really doesn't do anything super. She's only in it like a little bit. It's kind of weird. And the other lead, the, the, one of the lead guys, right? His name is Felonious Cat and he's a seven foot tall cat for no reason that it, that is explained. He, this is, this is just like our world that takes place in an unnamed East Coast city, except there's a seven foot tall cat in it. But he keeps his head down. No one, only like six people know he exists. But he runs the crime family. And people not knowing he exists becomes part of the rather complicated plot. And as you can see here, there's, there's a lot of text in it. Matter of fact, one of the letters in the letters page says that, Oh, the only place you'll find more words is an Alan Moore comic. But I'm okay with that. I don't find things too wordy when I like the words. And I like the words in this. And it was the writing that kept me, that hooked me on this first issue. Because the first, the letter, we find out in one of the other letters pages that this first issue was had a tight deadline and was rushed. And you can see it in the lettering. They actually typeset the lettering in the first issue. They didn't do comic book lettering, which makes it re readable. But the word balloons are terrible. The word balloons are amateur hour. So, but like I said, it's the words in the balloons that hooked me. And the art is okay. The art is beginner good. Um, it's not great art. You can see the guy has some talent. But it's, it's not, not... The main problem I have with the art, his storytelling is pretty good. The main problem I have with the art is, and throughout this whole series is the inking. I find the inking doesn't clarify things. His inking, his lines don't have line weight. Well, they have line weight, but it's haphazard. Uh, he doesn't. He doesn't use the ink. I mean, I, I'm I'm sure he just wasn't. He was new, and he he just you know wasn't that good. And like, look at those folds in there are kind of haphazard. The hair is a little haphazard. I mean, he's pretty good at spotting blacks, as you can see from this panel. But his inking overall, I, I wasn't a huge fan of. But like I said, the, the story is what really got me in this. And it's just, it reads more like a um, detective TV show than it does a comic book. Because there's, like there's a lot of dialogues, and they're constantly discussing, trying to figure out what's going on with these two crime families, actually three crime families, um, interacting and trying to set one another up. And the cops are trying to find him. And meanwhile, the cartoonist guy, who's the friend of the Black Dahlia, um, friend of the Black Dahlia becomes a main character because he gets involved in this murder. So, so there's the, the and, and like I said, it's the writing that really gripped me in this. I really enjoyed all their conversation. I really enjoyed them figuring things out. And despite the art being, um, kind of crude at times and me not liking the inking he made he made most of the characters very distinguishable so never was i confused about which character was which because he he just did some of the, some of them are, are outrageous punk rockers so you know one guy's a giant cat so I, I i never once had the trouble distinguishing one character from the other despite the huge cast and in the back, we get even we get a few sketches, but it was the and, and walk on the we get another little Mark Bloodworth himself gives us a little history of the character. Um, there's a Black Dahlia pinup. Just the sheer 1980s enthusiasm of this really made me nostalgic and really won me over. 
And the second issue was actually even got denser. There, that's a pretty nice. You can actually see, you know, Tim Sale and Frank Miller and guys like that in that page. You know, this looks like a little bit like Frank Miller Sin City before Sin City was around, but he's obviously influenced by Miller. But, but the, the second issue gets even denser with the. I mean, he's using a 12 panel grid. Forget the nine panel grid. For some of this issue too, he's using a 12 panel grid. Just trying to get the information across and trying to get you into the conversations, which I really enjoyed. But once again, that inking made some of the art really dense. And with the dense, with the dense dialogue and the dense inking, this isn't gonna be for everyone. I liked it. Look at it, these are 12 panel grids. How crazy is that? It was really, really getting stuff across here. But you know, some nice drawing in there and then a clunky profile. But that's what you expect from a beginner, a talented beginner, I'd call uh, Mark Bloodworth at this time. Look at more 12 panel grids. Like I said, I didn't have any trouble following the story. I, I was, I was, I read this all in one night too, which I rarely do. I rarely read five issues of the same thing in one night. So I was engrossed in the story and engrossed in the world. And he did some great, the density works in these um, cityscape panels where he's setting stuff up. I really enjoyed that. Look, he continues with the 12 panel grid. It takes a while to read these ones. So issue two is especially dense. In the back, we get our first letters page. You know, people just, uh, oh, issue two, Black Dahlia shows up, makes her first appearance at the, and the cops love Black Dahlia for some reason. We get more letters page stuff, which I really enjoyed reading. Issue three, our last painted cover by uh, Dean Armstrong, that's his name. He must have been a local pro. Like I said, this is this even, where was it? Uh, Arrow Comics was in uh, Michigan. Um, and here's fun another editorial. They give you a little what's going down, who all the characters are and everything. And Oh, and they even, in issue two, they formed an alliance. The Independent Comic Publisher Association. So they could put a stamp on their comic. Them and like two other small press companies I think he, they named them in here. I forget which ones. Oh, True Studios and B Movie. So it was like they were really trying. That's what made me so nostalgic was this sort of street level trying of making comics, which with the internet really, you know, you can still make it. No, you know what it was? In the indie boom, you could make it in comics in the comic shop. Nowadays, you can be an indie creator and make it through Kickstarter and, um, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or even a webcomic, but you're not really part of the comics world. With these guys, they were they were they were all of a sudden part of the comics world because you had to go to comic shops to get these. So it was a really a different time and place. Another editorial. Once again, with their association, they're starting to write where you can get comics available. And as you can see, after the twelve panel grids, we get we get even some more like that in issue three. Once again, I really enjoy these. Oh, and the lettering. They ch after the first issue, they changed, I forgot to show that, to traditional comic book lettering. And it was pretty well done. Who lettered it? Um, let's go to the back. Lex Morris lettering, whoever that lettered this issue. And the lettering got much better after issue one. Well, let's, here are more 12 panel grids. So issues two and three are filled with 12 panel grids. But you know, look, he was doing some nice graphic design stuff, too. That's just her getting on her motorcycle, leaving her motorcycle. So there were some ideas behind, besides the art being a little, and the inking's getting a little better, but it's still, it's still a little confused in the inking. More 12 panel grids. But like I said, there's so much in here. There's so much, so much plot, so much dialogue, and I really enjoyed it. Look at that, 12 panel grids, four by three. He was really getting into it, this issue. Then at the end, we get another letters page, some ads for the other stuff. Dead World was the other book I've heard of that Arrow Comics put out. The Realm and Tales from Annie Ver like they were trying. Here, here's their, you know, bullpen bulletins page they even got going on. 
then issue four. And and here, here's what really, really made me feel nostalgic too. We get a letter from a guy who's upset at the depiction of punk rockers. So Mark Bloodworth actually gets in there and starts defending his depiction of punk rockers and saying, just because some of the villains are punk rockers doesn't mean punk rockers are bad. So that was a real interesting piece of the time in May 1987. So that was kind of fun too. Nine panel grid, all of a sudden things are wide open. We go from the 12 panel grid to the nine, switches over to the nine panel grid for just a moment. And then we're back to nine. And look at that, he went, I don't think we get back. I think that that's an inch. I didn't even notice that as I was doing it. We went from four, four, we went from 12 to three across and all of a sudden we're in the nine panel grid. So I guess that was a, a conscious switch over from 12 to nine. Look at that. Story continue, the more nine stuff here. And, and this seemed to open up too. It really opened up once he got away from that 12 panel grid. Zimmerman on letters, was it different letter this time? Emperor Carr, huh? Well, like I said, really enjoyed this, really enjoyed reading the, um, all the, the back, the, the back matter and the front matter and, and the editorials. And, and issue five is where it all comes to an end, even though it wasn't supposed to, but in issue five, we get an editorial from Ralph Griffith, who was half of Stu and Ralph, who was like the assistant editor, who was like Ralph's off, to, went off and got a good job, got a real job. So it's kind of like, ah, uh, we, you, in hindsight, we can see, you know, once the editor, editor runs off to find a, get a real job, you know, that it could be near the end. But we as fans didn't have any idea that time. So here's a, what is it we got here? Three times, that's a different type of 12 panel grid. That's three by four. Completely different. As you can see, it's opened up a lot in this. Um, not, the inking is, di the inking is much better. He's not filling every little last bit of space with ink. But we're back to the 12, well, now it's a mixture of the 12 and the nine panel grids. Hmm. And the story continues. Like I said, I really enjoyed the story. Oh, there's one of those, uh, look at that nice shot there. I really like his cityscapes. He really sets the mood with them. But at the end we get Mob Rules Part 5 to be continued in Part 6. I think, I think, as a matter of fact, they give us, here's some, uh, some, uh, Slave Raver graphics pinups in the back. They tried. They were really trying. There's the conclusion of Mob Rules that never happened, except in that Caliper book. You can find the conclusion in the Caliper book, but I never got it. So there you go. Like I said, this made me. This really encapsulated. Besides being good, I, I genuinely enjoyed this uh, series. Uh, you have to be okay with. A guy at the beginning of his career, you have to be okay with some dense reading, which I, I really like. I, I am. If the dense reading is good, I'm fine with it. But if you, if you want to look into what the 1980s black and white boom was all about, here it is. It's about some, some guys really trying to make it in the comics world because probably for the first time in their lives, they had a chance to really make it because of the Turtles books. All right. You guys have a good week out there.